The following interview was conducted with Joe A. Brooks, Professor Emeritus of Nursing for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, September 29, 2010 at a residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Brooks, and thank you very much. Oh, um, Tell us a pleasure. little bit about uh, where you were born and your parents in early years. Uh, well, I was born in Attica, Indiana. Uh, spent my entire school experience there, and then when I graduated, I went off to college. Well, uh, tell us about high school and grade school. I this was is in Attica, a, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I loved being a student. I loved school, and uh, I didn't always get the best grades, but I was pretty close to the top in most everything. Sure. Uh, I liked algebra and geometry and history and uh, hated Latin. Uh, I can still remember our Latin teacher, a very rotund little lady, and uh, she had a rule that she would smack on the desk. She never smacked any of us with it, but she would smack it on the desk, and you knew that, you know, you were in trouble. Miss, Mrs. Reed, Miss Reed, and uh, so, but I had great teachers uh, who actually, many of them became lifelong friends, and uh, have kind of followed my career through the years, and so I still occasionally they're nearly all gone now, but there are a couple that are still sure, in their right. 90s, and so right. I occasionally hear from them, and which is always nice. So, right. What about high school? Where, did you go to high school I there? I went too? to high school there. Was that a large school? Or no, a no. I think uh, there were close to 70 in our graduating class. So, Any particular teacher that you know, you have some that sticks in your mind? Or what courses did you take? Were you college prep? Yeah, or? college prep. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's why I had to take the Latin. Okay. So. And I was going into nursing, so that, you know, they knew I thought I needed to know that, so I'd know medical terminology. Well, I'm not sure it helped me a whole lot, but, <laughs> but <laughs> those were the rules, so, you know. Sure. I'm basically, a, most of the time I'm a, I'm a rule follower, not always, but most of the time. Yeah. Uh, no, high school was a good experience. Uh, there was a, well, I guess they'd call them a clique now, but there was a group of us who were very close friends, and we still keep in touch. and. Uh, a couple of them I haven't seen probably for, well, it had been about five years, and we got together last summer, and we just picked off all like it was yesterday, you know. it's just, You can do that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was, yeah, my high school experience was a good experience. I was ready to get out of Attica because it's a small town. My dad uh, owned a uh, shell filling station, and so a lot of people in the town were in and out of his station, and he always knew what I was doing, sometimes before I did, so... It was, uh, I decided I was going to go to school as far away from home as I could get. Uh, I think he kind of wanted me to go to Purdue because he was a big Purdue fan at the time. But I decided that actually Purdue didn't have nursing at that time. And uh, since that's what I was going to pursue, that I would head off to Bloomington. So my grandfather was a staunch Republican. In fact, he was uh, chairman of the Republican Committee in Fountain County and got Cecil Harden to run for Congress. And they lived across the alley from each other in Covington. And he swears that my uh, experience at IU turned me into a Democrat. <laughs> he says, they ruined my granddaughter. <laughs> well, then you, well, after high school, you went down to Bloomington? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. But then how did the Purdue connection come about? Well, then? Did you start nursing down there? or I started, I started nursing, and then my, uh, my mom got very ill. And I came home to... Uh, take care of her basically we thought she was going to die she had breast cancer and in those days you know the mortality rate was very high well fortunately she got on a clinical trial and made a really almost a miraculous recovery and at the end of that time uh, my dad said well we want to we want to give you a special treat we want to send you down to Florida for a month just to relax and lay on the beach and do whatever you want to do so I went to St. Petersburg. I didn't know a soul there. And, uh, well, I took the train, too, right? Yes, to I did. It was yes, the only I, way to get there. Oh, yeah. yeah. I took the train, on, left from the Monon Station, and I had my suitcase and my clothes, and off I went. And uh, I did have a place to stay. Uh, I had looked in the paper, and uh, at that time, they didn't have many motels or hotels, but they had tons of beach or uh, guest houses up and down the beach. That you could stay in. Yeah, that you could stay in, you know, oh, for wow. so much a week or so much a night or how long you were going to stay. So I made reservations for one of these places. I just made it for a week because, I, you know, I figured after a week I could check the area out and decide if I wanted to stay there or move someplace else. 
And I, that's, I met a young lady there who was uh, in Florida, and she was getting ready to start uh, her nursing career at St. Petersburg Junior College. And uh, first thing I know, she talked me into going to school. <laughs> as long as I'm here, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so I enrolled uh, in the St. Petersburg Junior College. The, they had an associate degree nursing program. And I enrolled in that and was going to school. Carol and I were living uh, in the nursing dorm. And then after a semester of that, because we were older than the other kids were like 17, 18. We were a little older and we just couldn't stand, you know, being around those young kids. So we moved off campus in a little apartment. And I met a young man who became my husband. We married, gosh, I guess within six weeks after we met. And uh, I got pregnant just almost bang right after that, apparently. Was he going to school at the time? Or no, he was uh, working for the city of St. Petersburg. He was a civil engineer and uh, had gone to Georgia Tech, so I used to call him my Georgia Tech mess. And uh, I guess I was about three months pregnant uh, when I went to have my first checkup. And uh, the doctor asked me, you know, when my last menstrual period was and I told him and he said oh that's got to be wrong he said you're just way too big for that and I said I know exactly when it was I keep track of these things I'm a nurse I keep track of these things and he said well we'll see so he did the exam and uh, my uterus was much larger than he expected for someone who was three months pregnant and uh, so he said well let's do an ultrasound because he said you know could be there's multiples or it could be there's something else going on. So they did an ultrasound. Of course, they wouldn't think of doing that in, in this day and age with uh, someone at three months in that first trimester. But uh, there were two. And, uh, oh, my gosh, we were both, Larry and I were just devastated. It was like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do with two babies? You know, one we thought we could probably manage, you know, but, to, oh, to have two to take care of, it was just, oh, we just didn't know what we were going to do. We were living in a small apartment over a garage uh, about a mile from the campus, and it was what you would call a uh, fixer-upper, but it was cute, you know, just cute. Some of me. those are really nice yeah. at home people. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had a little living room, a bedroom, a kitchen that we ate in, and a bathroom. Sure. And uh, we just had it all fixed up, and it was just cute as a button, and my, all my nursing friends, student friends, just loved to come out for lunch because they thought that was a cute little place. So I was, uh, I made it through the first semester, uh, which in the, uh, at St. Petersburg in the, in the, the, their semesters were not like they are now, so that the first semester actually ended after the first of the year, mm -hmm. so that we had a big Christmas break and then came like back. Like it used to be here. Yeah, like fine. it used to be here. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I was doing clinicals and, uh, my patients <laughs> they were so funny. I was working at a VA hospital, doing my clinicals at a VA hospital, and so these old vets were going to look out after me, you know, make sure I, everything was okay. And so they would not let me make their beds. They made me sit down in a chair, and they would make their beds, and then when the head nurse came around, they'd hop back in bed. <laughs> so nice. They were taking good care of me. They were taking good care of me. Yeah. And then one of my sociology professors, I came in after I had uh, given birth, because I, I gave birth on January 7th, and the semester wasn't up until like the 15th or something. So I had to come back and take final exams after, after I delivered. And you had twins? Would you have twins? Girl? Yeah, I had twins. Girls? Twin girls, yeah. Fraternal or identical? Identical. Wow. So I came back into class to take my final exam, and uh, we had assigned, assigned seats because he wanted to learn our names, and the only way he could learn our names was if we had assigned seats. So I went to my seat, and there was a little rubber ring that he had gotten for me to sit on because his wife had told him that I would be so sore I couldn't sit on those hard chairs. <laughs> oh, how about that? So. Interesting. Yeah. And then what did you, then you had to take, did you drop out of school? I dropped out of school, okay. yeah. I dropped out of school to take care of the babies because I had my hands full. My mom came down, and she stayed about a month. And but did you have room in your garage apartment or well come actually my landlady had a spare room and so my mom stayed there at night and then she would come over in the daytime because Larry went to work and then sure and uh, shortly after she went home uh, our marriage just kind of fell apart I guess he the responsibility of twins and a wife was just more than he could handle so uh, he 
They were uh, changes. For divorce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then I moved back to Attica. With the children? With the children. Mm-hmm. Lived with my folks and uh, slept on a fold out couch and I had two cribs in the room. Actually, I only needed one because they both slept together. They would, if we separated them, they'd just howl and make such a fuss that we'd put them back in just in one crib. And each one of them had their little corner and their little end, and they'd stay there. And uh, sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd hear them. They were just talking to each other, like rah 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 oh rah rah rah, just with inflection in their voices, you know. So it was just like they were carrying on this conversation. So. But my mom Could you was, tell the difference? Because you said they were identical. Initially, I couldn't. I mean, they I, they wore their their uh, arm yeah. brands till they were. I could. They couldn't get them. I mean, they were so tight. I had to take them off because I could not tell them. I mean, if I got up close, one Leslie had a little a little mole right on her eyebrow when that she was Laura born. Didn't have. Yeah. Okay. And Laura didn't have that, so if I could get up close enough to see that, then I could tell them apart. But, you know, if they were over there on that on that love seat, I couldn't tell you who was who for the longest time. So, And I, I, I breastfed them, and it was interesting. I didn't realize it, but apparently I had gotten into a habit of one would be on the right side and the other one would be on the left side, and once in a while I would get them twisted up. They wouldn't nurse on the other side. They were so used to the nipple coming in from one way that they, you know, they just you could tell. Right, they could tell right away. Oh yeah, yeah. Interesting. Not my spot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then I guess they were probably about three months old. I was getting really restless, and uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. So I uh, got a job in Williamsport Hospital, working as a nursing aide, and because of my background, I, they gave me additional responsibilities, and so I was really kind of a little junior nurse. I didn't pass meds, but I didn't nearly everything else that they did. Sure. And like a nurse's aide or yeah, whatever that they yeah. have today. And uh, the nursing staff all said to me, Joe, you've just got to go back to school. You'd make an excellent nurse. You just, you've got to go back and get your degree. And I said, I just can't face moving to Bloomington for three and a half years because uh, I'd have to leave the girls here. There's no way I could go to school with them, you know, full time. And um, I don't know, somewhere along in the discussion, one of them brought this article in that Purdue was starting a two-year associate degree program. And they said, you ought to go ahead and talk to this lady and see what, you know, what, what you could do. So I eventually did make an appointment and went up and talked to Helen. And uh, Where were they located at that time? Uh, Joe, the remember? third floor of the Student Health Center. Okay. Yeah. I think it was Dr. Tyler's office, as I recall, either the second floor after he stepped down and you know, from like Sophie, because he had that book, uh, Who's Your Remedies? Uh-huh. I bought one. I wanted him to autograph it, so because I, I was giving it to my brother, and, uh-huh. and I remember I had to go to the hospital. Yeah, and that's where he was located. Yeah, yeah. and huh. we did our clinicals at St. Elizabeth and Home Hospital and Wabash Valley, and uh, but that's where our classes were. The classes were there too, uh-huh. as well. Yeah, we had our classes there. Yeah. So you got in, you got accepted, and it was yeah, a small, I, something was, I read was a small class, there yes. were 30 students, but only 17 graduated. Yes. That's a big drop. Oh, yeah. Uh, there were, it was an interesting class, about half this of us. This is your inter- the entering class, yeah, correct? Okay. About half of us were people my age who had some experience, and several some of us were married. Oh. Yeah. And the other half were right out of high school. Well, the difference between the two groups, you know, Boy, yeah. our group just drove the, you know, the grade point average up, and a lot of them just couldn't make it because of us probably if they'd been in with all all their peers they probably would have done much sure. better but so anyway uh, got through all that lots of things my kids went to Humpty Dumpty Nursery School which used to be on University Street and I had we lived out in uh, University Housing out by the oh, airport oh you moved into town moved yeah here. moved okay. here okay yeah uh, I had an old well, it wasn't beat up, but an older Buick that my dad gave me so I could, you know, get to church and the grocery store and do things like that. But going back and forth to school, I walked. And I had a little red wagon that I put the girls in, and I pulled them up the street to the Humpty Dumpty Nursery School. And uh, so it was it was a good experience. Right, yeah. Um, then it wasn't easy, you, but it was good. Yeah, when you finished, then what was the next, what came next? Uh, and I was in two years, you got right, associate degree. Right, okay. right. Uh, took the state boards, and uh, our class did extremely well. Uh, Helen was so proud of us. In fact, when we had our senior dinner, uh, she said that her 
her dream was that one day one of us would come back and be head of the school of nursing. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. So nice? when she hired me to be on the faculty, she reminded me of that. She said, now, Joe, you know. This I'm is the next have... step, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So after I graduated from Purdue, I went to uh, Williamsport Hospital and uh, was working there as an RN. Did and the children come with you? Uh, I lived in Attica, so I just drove back and oh, forth. Oh, okay. So you yeah. moved back then. Yeah. Uh, so uh, drove back and forth, and uh, one of the uh, young physicians, and he was actually from, uh, I'm trying to think of a little town, West Lebanon, and uh, he decided he wanted to become a medical lawyer to work on malpractice, medical malpractice suits. So he was going back and forth to the IU campus in Indianapolis to law school at night. And uh, he knew that, you know, I was thinking about going back to school to get my baccalaureate degree, but I hadn't, you know, hadn't figured out how to do that yet. And he said, well, Joe, I'm going down there two nights a week. You could just come with me and start in the nursing classes. And so I thought about it for a long time and went down and talked to them, and they thought that was a pretty good idea. They said, you know, at some point you'll have to be here because you'll have to do your clinicals, sure. but you can get a lot of things out of the way doing that way. Uh, so, of course, my Purdue credits all transferred, so I had all the sciences out of the way, and my clinical nursing here started, counted, so I only had to do really like three semesters of clinical nursing. Uh, so we started, uh, Dr. Hale and I started driving back and forth. He had a big Lincoln. It was just plush. He'd sit over there and drive and smoke I his cigar. I remember the big car. Oh, and I'd wow. sit over in the passenger seat and keep him company, and, you know, not a worry in the world. He was... He was a very fast driver, but he was a good driver. I mean, he got us there. In and you didn't have 60, you had 52 probably then yes. in those days. Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So we zipped back and forth and uh, did that for a year and a half. And then I was at the point that I was going to have to move because I had clinicals to do, and that was just too hard to do with uh, commuting back and forth. So we, we moved to Indianapolis, uh, had a little duplex out in Broad Ripple. Uh, the girls started first grade there. No, actually, first they went to nursery school there. They went to the, what was it? Oh, gosh, it was a real famous uh, daycare for working mothers. It was on, uh, well, I can picture it, but I can't tell you where it is. That's oh, the Indian, Indianapolis Daycare Center. Okay. And uh, they had a, uh, a board, and uh, all the people on their board were, you know, very wealthy women. Some men, but mostly women. This was kind of the, their junior league activity, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had fundraisers every year, and so one year it's they were... a good were, school, then. Uh, yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, they were doing uh, pictures uh, for their fundraiser. And, of course, the twins were, they were just adorable. So, you know, they were in everything that they did, you know. So uh, they had took a picture of them. It got, ended up getting picked up for by the star when they did the... Uh, story on their fundraiser. So they were very proud that they had their picture in the paper. They were just <laughs> full of themselves. <laughs> and uh, that was about the time that uh, my ex-mother-in-law got in contact with me because she was afraid there were hard feelings and I wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. And But she said, you know, Charlie and I would just love to have a relationship with you and the girls. So they came to Indianapolis. That would be her husband. Yeah, her yes. Husband. Okay. Yeah. So they came to Indianapolis, uh, got a motel, and they stayed about a week and got to know their granddaughters and just had a wonderful time. Nice. And uh, we've been very close ever since. So that's nice. I'm I'm glad she reached out and did sure, that. Right. So and it's it hard out. for her to do. You know, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she just never forgave her husband for leaving us and depriving her of her twin granddaughters, but she got them back, so it worked out all right. Mm-hmm. So let's see. Then you, when you fin you got finished, and then yeah. what happened next? Uh, it says you were at, went at Marion County Bureau of Community Health Care. Yes, Nursing. that was my uh, first job. Oh. I was with the uh, one, when I was taking my classes. I've taken a, an advanced sociology class, and one of my classmates was uh, worked for the Bureau of Public Health Nursing, and she was telling me what a great job it was and all the different things she did. And I thought, oh, this just sounds like a dream job. You know, first of all, it was eight to five weekends off and what for could be a working better? mother what you know what could be better 
but she said, you know, I don't know. Uh, Mrs. Carlin has never hired anybody without a baccalaureate degree, but she said, you know, you're so close to being done, you ought to go down and talk to her and see what, you know, maybe she could do something for you. So I did, and actually she ended up hiring me because I was going to graduate within like six months, so she went ahead and brought me on board. And uh, gosh, that was just a wonderful time in my life. I made such good friends there, and uh, we had some crazy times. My supervisor used to say, honest with Pete, Joe, any event for a party, you're up for it, aren't you? I said, oh, I love parties. <laughs> so I was the official party planner for right. the office. Okay. Uh, oh, one of the things, I, almost, I thought I was going to get fired over this one. We wanted a new copy machine, and the Bureau didn't have enough money to buy us one. We had an old uh, mimeograph machine. I remember. Remember those? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my oh. gosh. So I decided that while our supervisor, when Velma was on vacation, that we would have a little fundraiser in the office. Well, I made wonderful pancakes. I had that uh, starter dough, friendship starter dough, and I made pancakes out of that. So we decided we would have a pancake breakfast, and we invited everybody in the building and all the offices around, and then a lot of the people in the other nursing stations who knew us, they came by, and uh, we <laughs> had a bunch of electric skillets, and we cooked up pancakes and bacon, and oh, my gosh, we had such a good time laughing all the way. and. Uh, got enough money to buy our new Xerox machine, our copier, and uh, so when she came back from vacation, we had it installed, and she said, where did this come from? And I said, well, we had an anonymous donor. She said, he must have eaten a lot of pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> so she found out about what we'd done, so. Oh, she, was, but, she was content with it, was yeah, okay. Yeah, because right. the end result was good, so. That's right, yeah, exactly, yeah. okay. Uh, so, uh, gosh, I was there about five years, uh -huh. and um, they were wanting to push me up and get, make me uh, move me into administration, and I just felt that I needed to get my master's degree before I did that because a couple of my friends, they had done that, and they promised them that they'd give them you know, all the help they needed. Well, they got in those jobs, and they had no support. They had no mentors, and they were just going crazy, and I thought, I'm not setting myself up for that. Yeah. So I said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to, this is the time I'm going to go to the University of Michigan and get my master's in public health. And uh, gosh, the girls were going into fourth grade. So I got admitted and I had a nursing uh, scholarship from the, from the U.S. Public Health Service, mm. which paid for my tuition and everything else, actually paid my whole way through. And I Did got- Did you get a stipend as well? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. And for every year I worked in a needed area, of course Indianapolis was always a needy area, uh, I would get so much of my loan forgiven. So that, that seemed like a pretty good deal to me. Sure. So we moved to Michigan. Uh, my folks were just devastated that I was moving out of state and taking their granddaughters with them. Uh, so my dad wouldn't help me move. So I, one of my friends at the office had two sons, and they were 21, 22, and I said, I said, would the boys be willing to get a rental truck and drive me and the girls to Indianapolis and I'll follow in the car or to Ann Arbor? She said, oh, sure, they're always looking for something to do, and I was going to pay them $100, which was a lot of money to them. Oh, yeah. So we did. We got the house all packed up, and off we went to uh, Ann Arbor. We had, a, we had a dog at the time, and I knew I couldn't take the dog, so we had to take the dog out to the Humane Society and, you know, of course, they told the girls that, you know, they'd find a wonderful home for Corky and, you know, he would be well-loved and well-taken care of. Well, of course, now they know that that probably didn't happen, but but we also had a cat, so I decided we would take the cat with us because I figured I could hide a cat, you know. And this cat was really pretty quiet. He didn't make much noise, so as long as we had his litter box and his food down, he was pretty happy. Of course, he was used to going outside. So we got moved in, and... Uh, would you get an apartment or a house? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We uh, had, they had student, married student housing, oh, just like Purdue had. So uh -huh. we had a little uh, two-bedroom apartment, uh, two stories, uh, kitchen and a li large living room, really. Uh -huh. And then upstairs were two bedrooms and a bath. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and we had a full basement. Wow. And uh, That's life of luxury. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it really was. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good deal. Oh yeah, and it was it was cheap, and all all of us out there were we were all on stipends and federal grants, and none of us had any money. Gee. So by the end of the month, we were all nearly broke, and so usually on the last day before paycheck, <laughs> we would have uh, what we called slop supper, and everybody would bring their leftovers. And we'd make soup out of part of it, and the rest of I don't. We just did all kinds of things. Speaking, you can be creative. Yes, you can be yes, creative. When, need, yes. when need, the need arises. Yes, yes, you can be. So those were always fun times. And it reminds me uh, of some friends of my family on Thursday night. My mother used to say they that was icebox night. Whatever was left yeah. in the icebox, I'm yeah. saying, oh well, it was always good stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love actually. I love leftovers. My husband hates them. I think it's because. He grew up during the Depression. Of course, I did too, but our experiences were most different. And his, he hated leftovers because that's all he could remember from that period was right. he had to eat leftovers. So, uh, uh, as I say, made that through. Uh, what I a nice my, thing to do at the end of the month. Everybody's yeah. in the same boat and we can just enjoy it. Exactly. What the heck, you, know? you know, we'd spurt for a bottle of wine and you sure. know, the kids would go watch television and you know we'd sit out on the couch and in the living room enjoy and it, talk right. and yeah, have a good time. Yeah. Right. Uh, I did my one of my clinicals. I did in downtown Detroit, and there were actually five of us who were. I bet that was different in those days. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. But driving to Detroit was still a nightmare. Oh. So uh, we decided we'd carpool, take their, take you know turns driving. That way we'd spread the cost out. So uh, the first day we went it was somebody, and the second day we went somebody else, and the third day was somebody else, and the fourth time it was my time. And I had this Buick, and it was in those days Buicks were like tanks. They were big, sturdy cars. And I always felt safe in that thing because I knew if anybody hit me other than a big t truck, I'd be okay because uh, we didn't have seat belts, but I was still, you know, I felt yeah. very safe in the car. And I was, We didn't drive with seat belts either. No. Know? And, you know, I, I felt I was a good driver. So I drove and dropped everybody off and then picked them up and we came back home. Two of, two of them went to the visiting nurse service in downtown Detroit. And my friend and I were working with the Division of Public Health Nursing in Detroit, so we went to a different place. So I'd pick them all up, and we, I got home that night and uh, dropped, I was getting ready to drop the first one off, and they said, uh, Joe, uh, we want to talk to you for a minute. And I said, well, did I do anything wrong? They said, no, 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 you're such a good driver. If you will drive every day, we'll buy your gas and pay you $5 a day. <laughs> So I was the designated driver, so I drove into Detroit three times a week. So. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. They, they chose you out of the uh, lot. Well, my theory was if you don't, you know, if you're trying to merge or do something and you don't look and the guy doesn't make contact, he knows you're not going to get out of the way, so you just keep right on going. Well, the rest of them, they were very tentative. You know, they'd come up to some place and they'd, they'd look around. Well, if you stop and look at, in Detroit or any big city, they'll just move right over you. So. That's right. So I was a You're dead in the water. Yeah, yeah. So I was a pretty aggressive driver, I guess. Uh, but that was a good experience. And then I fully intended to go back to Indianapolis, and they had an open, an open supervisor's position that they were hoping I would come back and fill. And, gosh, it must have been around Thanksgiving time. Uh, got a phone call from Helen Johnson. I mean, when, is that a, was that a one-year program, Joe? Or yes. Or was yeah. it one year? Well, okay. it was a year and a summer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, because uh, we finished up then in August, mm -hmm. uh, so Helen called me around Thanksgiving time and said that you know she had just learned that I was up there. She had called Dr. Car Mrs. Carlin at the bureau to find out if she had anybody on her staff that might be interested in teaching, and uh, apparently she told uh, Helen that well she had one person and she, I, I might just fit the bill, but she really didn't want to give her my name because she didn't want to lose me. And Helen said, well, that's not really fair. You know, let me talk to her, you know. And so she gave her uh, my phone number, and she called me and told me that what was going on at Purdue and uh, would I be interested. And uh, they were starting uh, their baccalaureate program, and they needed someone to come and teach public health nursing. And uh, she offered me a salary that was more than I would have made at the uh, Bureau of Public Health Nursing, which just blew me away. Five figures, man, that was a lot of money. Uh, so I came down to Thanksgiving, and no, I came down at Christmas time because we uh, didn't come back to Indiana for Thanksgiving, but we did come back for uh, Christmas because we had two week break, so we drove back for Christmas. 
So I went up to see her at Purdue, up on the third floor of the Student Health Center again. Still there. Yep, still there. Uh, and she interviewed me and uh, talked me into it. She said, well, Joe, just give it a try. She said, now I want to ask you one question. Now, I know that you've had a lot of new graduates come into, the, into your area, and you've had to orient them. And I'm sure you've said to yourself, honest to God, what, why don't they teach these kids anything? Well, I had to admit I had had that thought occasionally that, you know, I could sure do a better job than they were doing. And I said, I admitted that I had actually had that thought. And uh, she said, well, now here's your chance. You know, come and stay for us a couple of week, couple of years and, you know, see if you can do that and be satisfied with it. Well, I came and never left. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Because I really found my little niche in the world because right. I could do, really do both. I, I really had a practice because the students carried a caseload of, of uh, families that they visited. And then you just couldn't drop them over the summer, so I would continue to visit them through the summer. Uh, Up there my, in Michigan? No, here in Oh, Lafayette. here, okay. Yeah. okay. <coughs> uh, on my own time, which a lot of people thought I was silly to do, but I said, you know, we really have good relationships with these families. I said, I said some of them I just see once a month. But there are some I need to see every week to make sure everything's going okay. So uh, did that for, oh gosh, I don't know, several years. Um, then... Uh, when you came back, where did you live when you came back, when you uh, came on the faculty? Uh, I actually lived uh, on the South River Road. Uh, one of the faculty at Purdue was on sabbatical that year, and she was going to New York to spend a year at the National League for Nursing. And her house was the first, oh no, let me take that back. We lived on uh, South River Road in those houses the university used to own up there. On um, Catherine Wood Drive, right no, down the No, just down, down the, from that. Just down from there, yeah. okay, right. There were like five or six national homes okay. from the river road up to Catherine, that drive. Hmm. And uh, they were, because <clears throat> uh, when Helen sent me the stuff about from Purdue, one of the things I noticed was they did have some faculty housing available. So I called to find out what that was. and. And they told me that they were little national homes on Happy Hollow, and mm -hmm. it was yeah, close to those. close to a school, uh, and close to campus. And so, sight unseen, I rented one of them, and uh, so we moved in there when I came back. Uh, I had to miss graduation, which at Michigan is a big, big deal. I had to get permission from the dean to miss graduation, because graduation was on Sunday, and I was to start at Purdue the next day. And he said, well, I, I guess you have to miss it. We'll send you your diploma. He said, I really hate it because it's such a lovely ceremony. And I said, I know, I'm very disappointed to not be there with my classmates, but I can't turn this job down. So I have to be there. Yeah. So he excused me from graduation so I could get my diploma. And uh, we left on probably Saturday. Uh, and drove down? Drove down. Got, then we had all day Sunday to get unpacked and... I didn't have water, because I had forgotten about getting the water turned on. So I went over and knocked on the neighbor's door and, and told her who I was and what I was doing and explained. I said, I have to go to work tomorrow. I have no water, I can't take a shower. Oh, she said, honey, don't worry about it. She said, uh, just either come over tonight before you go to bed or come over first thing in the morning. So I went over that night, took my shower and got my hair all washed and everything ready to go. So but you had the children with you though. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, them I could just sit in the sink and wash them off, but sure. I couldn't do that with me, obviously. So uh, <laughs> got them enrolled in Happy Hollow School and uh, there were three kids, my, my twins plus three other kids, there were, so there were five of them that went to Happy Hollow School and they walked up the road crossed over it into Happy Hollow Park, went up the hill, and they were at school. And I think about those letting those kids do go through that park in the morning. Sometimes it was dark. Oh, I know. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't think of doing that in this day I and know. age. But I then, mean, yeah. you know. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it and worked. of course, they, they all survived it, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, so then... Uh, I finished up my first year at Purdue and I was starting to think about more permanent housing. Uh, oh, that was quite a place. The windows uh, in, in the wintertime would freeze on the inside. <laughs> Where you were down there? <laughs> yeah. Oh. That was PRF housing, wasn't yes, it? Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. But it was reasonable rent and uh, it was close to campus. And Did they, han they handle the maintenance too for you? Would they yes, handle, they, yeah, right. yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, they didn't mow the grass, but they did, you know, if they had sure. a plumbing problem or anything like that, they took care of that for us, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I started thinking about, you know, trying to find another 
either another apartment or a house to rent or maybe a house to buy. Because my dad had said, you know, if you find a little house you'd like to buy, I'll, you know, I'll help you with the down payment. So uh, Anne LaRue was uh, leaving for this sabbatical and uh, she came into my office and she said, Joe, I understand that you're going to be moving out of your, your university housing, that you're looking for a place. And she said, I'm going to be gone for a year and I, if you'd be interested uh, in renting my house, I would be delighted to have you there because, you know, you're someone I know and trust and I know you take good care of it. Uh, so I thought, well, gosh, all that moved for a year. But I thought, well, it's it's even closer to school, Happy Hollow School. It was on Chauncey Avenue. Okay. And uh, so I decided, well, I'll take a chance on it. So we, we moved. And then oh, about three-fourths of the way through the year, she called and said, uh, Joe, I've decided I'm not coming back to Purdue, so I'm going to put the house on the market. So if you are interested, and she gave me the realtor's name and phone number and everything, well, having lived there, I knew all the problems with the house, and so we negotiated what I thought was a very fair price, and ended up buying the house. So that's where we stayed Good. until that's nice. Yeah, very nice. So the girls went to Happy Hollow School and then West Lafayette uh, High School, and we were just kind of in between. It was like three blocks either way to uh, to either one of the places. Mm -hmm. And since we were so close to school, our house was the go-to spot after school. And always, I'd come home from work, and I, ne I would never know who was going to be there, whether they were going to stay for dinner or whether the mom was picking them up or what. But uh, it was it was fun. Yeah, they had a good time. Those are things you look back on and really mean a lot. Oh You're yeah, fun. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about talk about your research area, and then talk about the nursing center for family health that grant that you got yes. from the public. Uh, <clears throat> we were. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think what year it was. You probably know what year we got that grant. Um, 1980. Yeah, okay. We I came to Purdue in 72, and about 76, we decided that we needed to include a physical assessment course in our baccalaureate program. So Helen picked several of us, and she sent us. We spent the semester with various doctors in the area learning physical assessment skills. I was with Anson Hughes. It was just a dream. I don't know whether you ever knew him. He was an OBGYN. I recognize his name. Yeah. yeah. Terrific guy. Was very supportive. I mean, he he would let me do anything I wanted to do. He'd let me do surgery if I'd wanted to. Uh, but I learned a lot. Uh, and after that, I felt like, you know, I could really teach someone how to do a physical exam and understand what they were doing and what they were looking for. And so, uh, as I say, Helen had several of us. I think there were three of us that did that. And so then we were to start teaching the health assessment course. And uh, so we did that for a couple of years, and uh, there were a group of nurses uh, who were working who weren't going back to get their baccalaureate degree. They wanted those skills. And so they came over and talked to, to me about, you know, could I do an evening course or, you know, a weekend course or something. And my roommate was Mary Lou Holy, and she taught the leadership courses in the baccalaureate program. And so she's sitting here listening to this conversation, and, I, when they left, I said, well, you know, how many people are really interested in this? And uh, the person, I can't think who came, but uh, she said, well, there's quite a few. I said, well, why don't you get them together and we'll come and, I'll come and sit down and talk to them and explain what the course would be. That'll give me time to kind of lay out if we could do it in a weekend, you know, format, what it would look like and find out if, you know, if there's enough interest. Uh, I said, I'll have to find out from continuing it how many people we would have to have in the course, you know, to make it go. So uh, I got all that information and uh, went and met with the group and uh, decided that there was enough interest and there were, there were like 20. So I figured, well, even if 10 of them showed up, that would be enough to run the course. Sure, right. So uh, I said, well, let's, let's pick some dates and then I'll go see if I can get it on the calendar and we'll, we'll give this a try. We'll do a pilot. Uh, my uh, office mate was listening to all this and she decided that that sounds like such a fun thing to do she'd like to be involved in it and I said well Mary Lou you don't have assessment skills she said I'll get them well she did once she talked one of the physicians in Logansport which was her hometown into letting her spend uh, Fridays and Saturdays in his office so she could pick up assessment skills and she she did so we taught this course that first summer uh, with these, I, we ended up with 12 in the class. And uh, 
we, as we planned the class, we kind of laid out week week week, and then we thought, well, at the end, we need to see how they can put this all together. So we need to come up with a way for them to do a physical exam that we can watch. You know, they'd be going home, home and practicing on their husbands and their kids, and of course, on campus, they practiced on each other. But we wanted to see, you know, how they could do with a with a real person that they didn't know. So we thought, how in the world can we do that? And I said, I got a great great idea. I'll run around, I'll put posters, little notices up on the bulletin boards where the faculty would see them that uh, we were offering free physical exams, that these were uh, registered nurses who had come back for an assessment course and we needed uh, volunteers for them to do their final assessment on. So I, I must have had 20 of them up around and so I came back and I gave the secretary his phone number and I said, now Donna, you may get some phone calls and so I wrote out a little script for her to what to tell them and uh, so I went on then into the lecture and I was sitting at the back of the room because Mary Lou was lecturing that day and about halfway through I it was one of those classrooms where there was a door window in the door and I see this so it's Donna and she's so I went out to see I said what's wrong she said take those damn posters down I've had a hundred phone calls <laughs> I said, well, that's good. <laughs> How many people did you get for us? She said, I got enough for every student to do two phys- physical exams. <laughs> you lucked out, yeah. Lucked out. Yeah. So we set up a little mini clinic. Uh, at that time, uh, the nursing offices were over on South Campus Court. And we had a learning lab, so I just set that up uh, with the exam t- kind of mini exam tables, and the students did their exams there. Well, what was interesting was most of the people that came were what, we call the worried well. Uh, you know, they didn't have anything seriously wrong, but they'd have little things. I'll never forget this one guy. He came in and he had a little sore on the bottom of his penis. He could feel it, but he had never looked at it. And he was embarrassed to tell his wife or his doctor about it. But he just wanted someone to look at it to see if it was cancer. So he came went through this whole thing. Of course, that part of the exam was the very last thing we do. And uh, so when he when she when the student got to that point and fortunately she was an older student he was comfortable enough with her that you know if it'd been one of the younger gals she he might not have even brought it up but he told her what she was what he was worried about so she had him lay down and uh, she looked at it and she said oh I think it's just a mole but she said let me have my instructor come in and so I came in and, and he told me the story again and so I looked at it and I said well I'm 99 percent 99.9 percent sure it's just a mole and I said, I don't think you have anything to worry about. The next time you go to the doctor, you know, have him take a look at it. I don't, you know, you can make a special appointment. I don't think you need to. But he said, oh, you just don't know how relieved I am. He said, I've been worried about this for a couple of years. I said, well, why didn't you do something? He said, I don't know. I guess I was afraid I'd find out something bad, and I just didn't want to find out anything bad. So it dawned on me that we needed a place on campus for people like that to go who weren't really sick, didn't really need medication, they just, they needed Some someone to talk to. to. It, the intermediary in yes. sort of thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's really where the idea for the nursing clinics came from, was that encounter with, with a group of people over yeah. the summer. Right. Yeah. So we continued to do that course uh, over the summer for, I think we did it three or four years. Man, it just killed us. It was exhausting. Uh, then people found out, uh, other nurses found out that we were doing this, and so uh, they wanted us to come to them. And uh, so it was the same thing. We have to have at least 10 people, and this is what it's going to cost, and you have to make this commitment because we're not driving from here to Danville, Illinois, and have no one show up. And so we did uh, two sessions in in Danville at uh, Lakeview Hospital, and we did one in Crawfordsville. And they were all three very successful. In fact, some of those nurses I still run into occasionally, and we just laugh about some of the things oh, yeah, that right. we did that, so those summers. So uh, that was all well, that experience. And that came from the grant then? Is that, that helped? That, that was the oh. background for the grant. Okay. So when we got ready to grow, we, I finally, I went at Mary Lou and I went in and said to Helen, Helen, we need a permanent place to do this because there is such an unmet need on this campus. And she thought it was a great idea, but she said, Purdue doesn't have any money for that kind of thing. You guys are going to have to write a grant. So we said, okay, that's what it takes. That's what we'll do. Well, neither one of us had ever written a grant in our lives. So uh, I called the Division of Nursing and told them what we were going to do. And uh, they offered to send us a couple of 
grants that had been funded just to see what the format looked like and you know how to how sure. to go about it. So we set about wrote a grant and uh, got funded our first time out, which was really a big surprise because everyone said, "Oh, you know, you never get funded the first time in." So you know, just expect that yeah. they'll send back comments and you revise it and send it back in the next time. So uh, the award came and we were funded. Actually, the, Helen got the letter like at the end of the first semester. And uh, of course, they wanted wanted the grant to start right away. And she, of course, she wasn't going to turn that kind of money down. So she said, well, of course we can free them up. And uh, so Mary Lou and I were freed up to spend that first semester planning and uh, implementing, getting things ready to go so we could open up the clinic then the following fall and have students have clinical experiences there. So we did a couple of things. We went around and talked to key physicians in town that we thought might be opposed to it to kind of get them on board and at least let them know, even if they couldn't get on board, let them know what we were doing. Sure. We didn't want to do anything behind their back. But Dr. Hannon was one of our biggest oppo opponents. He just thought this was just the craziest idea. And uh, But we just plowed right ahead because we had enough support from other physicians in town that uh, he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to stop us. And he did say, he said, no, I'm not going to call up Washington and tell him I'm opposed to this. But he said, I just want you to know up front that I just think this is the craziest idea. And I said, well, Dr. Hanneman, you may be right, but then again, you may be wrong, and this will give us a chance to find out. So we got our grant, and uh, then it was, where are we going to put this clinic? Well, talked to Jim Blakely, and he said, Joe, we don't have any space that we can free up for a place like that. He said, now you've got that storage room down in the nursing building. He said, you know, you ought to talk Helen into letting you look at that. Well, every doctor in Lafayette who died and had an office full of equipment, they would donate it to the Purdue School of Nursing. So we had this room full of old exam tables, old file cabinets, old desks, old instruments. I mean, it was just... So... Fibber, um, Fibber's closet, Fibber McGee's yes. closet. Oh, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and uh, of course, Jim called Helen up and said, Helen, we just don't, I can't free any place up on campus. And he said, you do have that room in the basement that you're not utilizing. And he said, you know, the stuff that's down there, we could take out and put in storage for you if you want to keep all of it. So she finally agreed that, you know, that was probably the best thing to do and that we could have that space. Uh, so we started with the renovations. Uh, I talked to the guys from Physical Plan, told them what we envisioned doing, that we wanted to have three exam rooms and a work area and a reception area and a, a space for the students to sit and do their charting and, and uh, paperwork. So we came up with the plan. And there had been a set of cabinets at one end of that room, because I don't know what they had planned it for initially, but there had been a set of cabinets with a sink and all of that and uh, one of the fellows called me down. He said, Joe, we've been thinking about these cabinets. We're going to rip them out and throw them away, but how about if we just move them over here and then you'll have your work area? I said, what a great idea. So they really bought into it, too. They were very supportive. They were always coming up with you know something yeah, to do. Yeah, they can be very helpful. Oh, yeah. Right. And, of course, I'd have these nightmares over the weekend. I'd rush down there Monday morning, and they'd say, after a while, they knew. Okay, what'd you dream about last night? You know, it's like, oh, I dreamed you put this wall up in the wrong place. <laughs> so we got to know each other quite well and worked well together. And it was it was a busy time, but it was a lot of fun. So while they were building the place, uh, we were still out doing uh, PR around the campus. Uh, after we went for the physicians in town, we went around to a lot of the departments and talked to department heads about the service we were going to have available. That their this staff would be for these for faculty and uh -huh, staff for faculty and staff that Purdue. could okay. take use of, take advantage of, and got a lot of really positive response. And the in fact, the people in speech and hearing wanted to know if they could put students with us. So, uh, so we got everything ordered, got all the equipment ordered, the exam tables, the tables, everything we needed, the, all the equipment, the blood pressure cups, everything under the sun. It was nice to have that grant because I mean, I was like a little kid with a Christmas catalog. I'll take three of those, and three of those, and three of those, and it was just, for me, it was just a dream come true, because in public health nursing, I was used to scrounging around and trying to make do with everything, so this was just really a dream. Uh, so we opened up then the following fall. We had a grand opening, and uh, the assistant director of the Division of Nursing at the uh, Public Health Unit in D.C. came out for our grand opening and gave a very nice speech and was very complimentary and so got, got off to a good start. 
and the business was slow initially, but it just gradually picked up and right. gradually picked up, and finally we uh, had we had the school nursing had an advisory board and board and Helen about once a year would have me come and give the board an update on what we were doing. And Frida Francis, who was the director of nursing at St. Elizabeth at the time, stopped me after lunch one day and she said, Joe, I just keep thinking about this nursing clinic you have. And she said, you know, that's exactly what we need up in Delphi. She said, I can tell you the minute the doctor's office is closed because they pour down 25 into our ER and it's for cold and it's for ringworm and it's for this and it's for that. And she said, they're plugging up our ER. We need to find a place. I think she said, I think we ought to do a nursing center up there. And I said, well, you got any money? She said, no. And I said, well, you know, Purdue isn't going to give me any money to do anything like that. And she said, well, let me call around, see if I can find some money for us. And uh, she, I don't know who all she called, but eventually she found out that the state of Indiana, the health department, had some money for just exactly this sort of uh, venture that they were funding what they were calling nurse managed clinics in some of the rural areas in, in Indiana. So uh, she got the information, sent it back, brought it back, and I sat down with her and she said, I need someone from my staff to really work with you because she said, I just, I just, I don't have the time. And she said, I'm going to have Nancy Edwards be our liaison, so if you two will work together and get this grant in, well, she said, we'll just see what happens. So, uh, gosh, we had like six weeks to meet the deadline for this grant, so we really threw stuff together. We didn't have uh, much data from Delphi because the census data was outdated. You know, this was like in, it, the census data was like five years old, so it wasn't very helpful. But e, uh, St. E people had a lot of information on the people who used the ER from Delphi, from that zip code. So we were able to use that as part of our documentary documentary evidence and then we needed to get letters of support from the local community so we uh, had talked to Carol Miller who at that time was the director of the welfare department and uh, several people in the school systems and uh, somebody from Head Start and they all thought that you know gosh so many of their clients could use a place like this that you know they were for small all for things it. that don't need an ER yes. don't need yeah and so they were very supportive uh, they all wrote letters of support uh, so we got a grant together and sent it off. Um, the state looked at it and said that they were very enthusiastic about the site, thought we had a great idea, but there were just some things we didn't have in the grant that they needed to see. So uh, with Carol Miller and the people from the school, we were able to get the very detailed demographic data and economic data that they wanted to show that there was real need in Delphi. Sure. So we resubmitted the grant and got funded then the second time around. And then it was the same thing we did when we started up here. First of all, we made the rounds and talked to all the doctors who practiced in Carroll County. And then we looked for a place to rent. Where were we going to put this thing? And uh, that took a, a good semester. Oh, yeah. I bet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have as much money for equipment as we'd had from the federal government, so we kind of had to patch together equipment. But St. E was like the school nursing. They had this area in the basement that People had donated equipment and stuff. So Nancy and I would go over there and we'd scavenger and my husband would bring his truck over. He'd park outside the kitchen and we would haul stuff up the hallway into the... I said to Nancy, you're gonna think we're stealing this place blind. She said, nah, don't worry about it. So uh, we basically got enough stuff out of there to- To uh, get started To get anyway. started, sure. yeah. Sure. So, uh, and again, you know, we started off slow. Uh, we had a board because that was one of the things that the grant required was that oh, we yeah. had to have it's a good, board. You need, it's good to have. Oh, yeah. But that really threw Purdue for a loop. That a freestanding unit would have their own board of directors it was just. Mm -hmm. But there were I, showed them, right. I showed them the requirements. I said, you know, either we do this or we have to send this money back. Well, they didn't want to send back that kind of money. It was a quarter million we don't want to dollars. Turn, we don't want to turn no, money back no. ever. Yeah. So uh, you know, we had to work through the language. And that of helps that. the that helps to that helps the operation because you've got local people. Exactly, they that, felt some ownership. So you need that feeder. Exactly, exactly. Which is why the feds required that it be oh, in place. Yeah. yeah. Oh sure. So anyway, we got those bugs all worked out, and uh, <laughs> oh, which was uh, you know, people were by and large very supportive once they heard the story. But, you know, initially they were very skeptical about, well, I don't know whether we can do this or not. 
But uh, Carol Cox was actually in the pharmacy business office at that time, and she was a schemer and a wheeler and a dealer, and she said, we'll figure out some way to do this. So she was really a very supportive person from the very get-go. Uh, helped us figure out how, what to charge for things and uh, how to good. set up a budget. So, you know, she right. was just very supportive. Was there, uh, did you try to build something in those who could not pay, or did you have it on yes. a sliding scale? Yeah, we had it on a sliding scale. Okay. And we had a lot of no pays the first year or so. But now, I think, uh, last time I saw, I think nearly 75% we're paying some part of their fees, which is... Are these people, uh, do they, some of them have health care plans or... Most of them don't. Or they if don't. they do, they have a very high deductible. Oh. Uh, so, you know, they just... Okay. And most of them don't have any pharmacy coverage, so getting medicine was always a problem. Uh, we helped a lot of them get on... Most of the pharmaceutical companies have a uh, program for people that, for, in, for indigent clients and we helped a lot of them get their medicine for free through the drug companies. So, and that does that continue on to? Yes, it yes, does. yeah, they continue okay. to do that. Yeah. So uh, then we 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 were initially downtown in a storefront. Uh, then you know the clinic just kept growing and growing, and we were needing bigger space. This and is in Delphi, correct? Yeah, right. Yeah, this is all in Delphi. Yeah. And one of our staff members, Deb Mears, was uh, she went to the First United Methodist Church there. And the head of the welfare department went to that church, and um, a lady who was owned a lot of property in town went to that church. And so one day in their uh, adult class, they were talking about the, some of the needs in the community, and Deb was talking about the clinic and how well we were doing, and you know how much the patients just appreciated us being there, but that we were really outgrowing our space, and we were desperate to find a, a new place to move into, and. Uh, I can't think of this lady's name. Isn't that terrible? That's okay. They owned the grocery store right outside of Delphi, the IG. You can insert that afterwards. That's okay. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Anyway, she said, well, you know, I have that building in the lot there by the grocery store. And she said, uh, the bank moved out. And she said, there's nobody been in there. And there hasn't been anybody shown any interest in it. And she said, if... She if, owned the building? Yeah, she yeah. owned the building. And she said, you know, if, if you could use that, you know, I'd be willing to see what we needed to do in terms of renovation and, you know, getting it ready to turn it into a clinic. And she said we would keep the rent as, you know, as low as we could to help out. So uh, she had an architect come in, and we met, the three of us, she and Deb and I met with him, and uh, Deb and I explained to him kind of how we saw the clinic set up. You know, we need a waiting area. We need an office space for the, for the uh, staff. We need a reception area for whoever's going to collect the money and make the appointments, and we need a file room for records, and then, you know, we need a little lab, and we would like to have three exam rooms, and uh, so they kind of laid out a plan, and then she had a fellow from Rossville to come in and look at the plans and see if he could do the remodeling, because it was a cement slab, and so to get the water pipes into all the rooms, he had to tear up that concrete okay. floor. It was right. just a nightmare. Oh, yeah. I don't know how much she spent on remodeling that building, but, you know, she was willing to do it. And uh, so she was a real benefactor to the clinic and continues to do so. So. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I can't think of her name. Did yeah. the um, overtime, has it, is it uh, leveled off as far as the patients, or does there are peaks and valleys, or how does that... There are peaks and valleys, okay. but in terms of, boy, this recession really has hit people hard. And so a lot of people, we have become really their, their only source of care. You know, either they go to a emergency room, which they don't want them to go down there, so we're right there handy, and we can usually fit them in the same day they call, and we always hold some uh, appointment time for really emergencies. Sure. They call that morning and got a sick kid, and they just got to get them in. Uh, so, Yeah. It's uh, the number continues to grow, and the volume that the number of times we see each individual continues to grow, because they come to rely on us for more and more of their care. Right. So what is about the uh, span on the ages? Are they uh, they run all the gamut? Oh yeah, from do they? infants to ninety year olds. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Yeah, we do Any a lot of screening. We do uh, PSAs. Uh, we refer women for, we, we do the screening breast exams and then refer them for mammograms. Oh, okay. And we use the WISE program uh, for that because, you know, they offer the low discount 
uh, mammograms. Uh, we've turned up a couple of breast cancers that we caught early. So that's always very rewarding. All right. and, uh, through the years, we have just picked up an amazing number of young kids with very serious heart pro health problems, heart problems mostly, that their primary physician hadn't picked up on. So we were fortunate we had really excellent practitioners. Our pediatric nurse practitioner, I tell you, I'd put her up against any pediatrician in the state. She was just wonderful. And are most of them, or some of them nurse practitioners and others are just RNs that are yes, staffing it? Okay, yes. So you have both? Yes, yeah. Okay. The nurse practitioners do all the physical exams and the health assessments, and the RNs basically, are, you know, they'll do the follow-up and sure. uh, make the appointments if that's needed and uh, give injections and uh, take the vital signs and... Uh, the preliminary, the yeah. screening type yeah. thing. Right. Yeah, okay. get the history down and then, sure. yeah. I'm going to stop for a minute because it runs over a little an hour and I'm going to stop this and I'm going to ask you.